Let us pray. O oh Lord, take care of all our needs, but especially forgive our sins. Do not count them against us on that final day when all must appear before your throne of judgment. Grant that having trusted in you to the end, we will be found acceptable, clothed in the righteousness that you have merited for us. In that day, give each of us a crown of glory to wear forever in heaven. Hear us, precious Savior. Amen. We continue with hymn 764 in your worship supplements. the order of service starting on page 12 of your supplements. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him, and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him, and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, 
Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. us pray. As long as we are earthbound, O Lord, waiting for the blessed hour of our final redemption, supply us with the Holy Spirit and his grace that we may adorn our life with good works, giving ample proof of our faith and of the love we have for you. While we journey here as pilgrims and strangers in a, hostile wor a world hostile to you in our faith, guard and keep us safe from all evil that may threaten our bodies or souls. Keep us each step of the way, lest we yield to temptations. While of necessity we must be involved in earthly tasks and labors, let us not neglect our higher calling as laborers in our Heavenly Father's vineyard, proclaiming repentance and remission of sins to others. O Jesus, we ask this in your name, the name of you who reigns with Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. For this 21st Sunday after Trinity, we'll be focusing on the theme that nothing separates you from the love of Christ, from his mercy, his grace. All trial that comes upon you serves to strengthen your faith. And so these trials may come in various forms. Our first lesson dwells upon the form of persecution and even perhaps that of the government. We see this in Daniel 3, 19 through 30, where we see the Lord's merciful hand spare his servants from the wrath of Nebuchadnezzar and showing them the power of the Lord God. We read, The Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. And these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent, and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. The Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire. And the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together. And they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. And the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So far, our Old Testament reading. When it comes to the trials that we face as Christians in our life, we talk about three particular enemies against our faith, Satan, world, and sinful flesh. And yet we see that the Lord has, is the solution, and his word is the solution, to overcoming these trials and temptations from these three. We read of such a solution in our Psalm of the Day, Psalm 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, and they would have swallowed us alive when the wrath was kindled against us, and the waters would have overwhelmed us, the stream would have gone over our soul, and the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us his prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. So far, our psalm of the day. Our second lesson from Romans 14 shows the broad spectrum of things that the Lord gives us power to overcome through his grace, whether it be as small as unfair, unscriptural criticism, to as large as death itself. Christ gives you confidence and hope for your eternal future in him, justified and one day glorified by his atoning work. We read in Romans 4, 4 through 12. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One per a person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks, and he who does not eat to the Lord he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. So far, our second lesson. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it.
now confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed on page 15. Please rise. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with verses 1 through 4 of 523. Please be seated. Please rise. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon is based upon John 8, 5, verses 1 through 8. We read, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. 
One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So far our reading. Please be seated. Beit Kesed. These two Hebrew words that I just spoke, translated into English, mean house of mercy, house of grace, house of undeserved love. To read more smoothly in English, our Bibles have the word Bethesda. Bethesda means house of undeserved love. And the people of Jerusalem dubbed the pool complex mentioned in today's lesson the house of undeserved love, for it is this place which had a, was a, used as a natural healing center of those in need. And the gift of healing came by God's benevolent providence and by no merit whatsoever of the sick and ailing. The name Bethesda and its meaning makes me think of hospital names, Grace Hospital, Mercy Hospital, not uncommon names for hospitals, of course. Back in Aberdeen, South Dakota, there's even a nursing home complex with the very name Bethesda. That's what I think of every time I see this. And although these types of names are fitting for medical centers, for the Lord shares his love through his providential hand given in medicine, I don't know, though, if the names are ever fully pondered by most of the residents or staff. Like the sick at the pool, everyone tries to grasp at a spot on the waiting list, an extra night in the hospital, or procedure that may not be cleared by insurance. Oftentimes, the undeserved part of the name Grace, Mercy, Bethesda are forgotten as patients scramble and demand and doctors and insurance companies, whether fairly or not so, put their foot down. And so, in similar fashion, we see the name forgotten in our text, for though the pool is named House of Mercy, the people act as if it's named House of Better Luck Next Time. And as the lame man lays there, losing out time after time, Jesus takes his attention away, focusing instead of, instead of focusing on the pool and focusing on the real house of mercy, who says, do you want to be healed? In this lesson today, we will see Christ our Lord as the real house of mercy and all their blessings of this life, simply the gifts of his hand. Seeing this, we pray, Lord, sanctify us by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. Jesus is the real Bethesda in this story. But a little comparison needs to be done in order to make that apparent. Let's paint the picture of the narrative so that the glory of the Lord may be even more so appreciated. So imagine coming up to a concrete pool structure and around it are five large stone porches. And each of them lay all sorts of sick and ailing people on mats. Blind people, people who can't walk, people who can't move at all, sick people of all kinds, all laying in the shade of the porches. The moans, the complaints, the jaded breaths out of each person's mouth, all waiting and watching for the pool to start bubbling. You see, the bubbling water had a healing quality to it. And it appeared to be that way for some time, hence Jerusalem building porches around it, making it a sort of swing bed area for healing. This pool was quite a natural ordeal. It could heal anything, so it seemed. And it was said that the Lord would send down an angel, one of his servants, to stir up the waters of the pool and imbue them with a healing quality. You would think that with a gift as great as this, 
Maybe the people would organize themselves in a wait-your-turn sort of fashion. But as so often happens with the gifts of the Lord, the people fought over them rather than sharing. No self-sacrifice, no mercy shown to each other, no regard for each other's quality of life. The house of mercy was a dog-eat-dog -dog race to the pool. Blind people hearing the noise, making mad dashes into other blind people. Lame and paralyzed people begging the help of healthy bystanders and family members to lift them and throw them into the water. Sick people harming their weak bodies and spreading disease by pushing and shoving each other. For you see, the first one in was the one that was healed. House of mercy, huh? It seems as though they had forgotten what that word meant. All these people, by virtue of their sinfulness, deserved their plight, yet the Lord God blessed them with his undeserved love, with a healing mechanism for their physical bodies. You think that by simply following their father's will laid out in the fifth commandment, these people could wake a way that would benefit everyone. But no, that's not how the greedy, sinful flesh works. They all stare at the tool rather than the user, focusing on the pool as if it were God himself. And this is where we find the man with nearly a four-decade-long infirmity doing the exact same thing. When Jesus, the Son of God, stands by him to ask, do you want to be healed? The man simply verbalizes what's probably been in his head for years. Sir, they beat me to the pool every time. Little did the man know that Jesus would call his attention away from this pool to the real house of mercy. So people of the five porticos sitting here today, I ask, what is it that ails us? And what is the pool that we've been focusing on? Is it physical pain and handicap like the man at the pool? Or perhaps we're the loved one waiting to throw our beloved into the hot spring? And what I'm getting at is the encouragement to not let your hearts be troubled. We don't want to be like the seedlings that are scorched by the sun of trial and temptation or choked by the thorns of worldly wealth. Don't let pain come in between you and your Lord. Jesus is still your God in health and in sickness. Cast your cares upon him. Stop staring at the pool and start staring at the God-man, asking the question, do you want to be healed? Or the one who puts it to us today, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Or maybe it's not physical pain that's bothering you, but one of the other concerns addressed in our scripture readings. Perhaps it's persecution from friends for your faith or fear of government persecution. And when these fears come, we often get so locked into our nar narrow-minded solutions, putting blinders on that block out the sight of the merciful hand that spared Daniel and his friends from the flaming wrath of Nebuchadnezzar. Stop focusing on the pool and focusing on the Lord instead who asks, do you want to be rescued? It can be any sort of distraction, really, as our epistle reading shows. It can be as little as receiving unfair, weightless judgment from another person, or as large as death itself. Who are you staring at in this instance? The perfect comeback to unfair criticism? Or the perf perfect solution to fix someone's faith weakness? Or the one that tells you, do not judge according to your standards? It reminds you that God will judge according to his holy standard, and that all are saved in Christ by faith. Or are you staring at how much time you have left in this life and trying to figure out how you can add a few more cubits to your life? Or are you rather staring at the one who asks you, do you want eternal life through Christ Jesus your Lord? Beloved, worrying, obsession, coveting, and jealousy, fear of life, circumstance, is this not just all idolatry in the end? Don't worship the pool. Don't let modern medicine and quick-witted solutions become your main focus. By all means, recognize these as God's gifts and simply that, gifts from the giver of grace. But we often fail in doing that, don't we? I do, that's for sure. 
but thank God that he sent his son to save us from our failure in this instance. He sent him for you and me and for the man waiting at the pool. Jesus approaches the disheveled man and asks him a simple question, do you want to be healed? Obviously he did, and the man perhaps thought this was a prompt for him to complain, but that wasn't Jesus' point. Jesus asks the man so that the man may focus in on his wretchedness, his helplessness, and the man sits under the porches of the house of mercy, pondering the Savior's question, yet doesn't answer in a way acknowledging the mercy before him. Yet on that day, the man would remember Bethesda as a house of mercy, not because of the pool, but because of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. In mercy and grace, this man was healed. This man did not deserve to be healed, but deserved temporal and eternal punishment. Yet Jesus, the embodiment of grace, mercy, and truth, out of his love, pity, and passion for sinners, becomes Bethesda for this man. Jesus says to him, arise, take up your bed, and walk. And so the man was healed that day. The house of mercy is no pool, but it is the Lord made flesh, Jesus Christ. Jesus, our Emmanuel, is the house of mercy who by the gospel, the good news declaring him as your Savior and Lord, has called you to look to him in childlike faith during any hardship and trial in your life. A lifetime of disease and day after day of waiting and watching and pain and sadness, the man, the disheveled man and others brought all this pain of theirs brought to an end quickly just by Jesus speaking the command to get up and walk. A notable case, such as the 40-year disability, and on the Sabbath day, no less, Jesus' glory was certainly on full display, displaying that nothing is too large for him to handle. And so, beloved of God, all of you who are hurt by the pool of Bethesda with whatever ails you, hear the good news that Bethesda, the house of mercy, is not the medication, conflict resolution, or what allevi alleviation you think it is. Bethesda is Jesus Christ, the house of mercy given to you by the Father. He came willingly to earth to take on the same human flesh you have. He suffered through every trial you did, and has known everything you have been through. A high priest who has been tempted in the same way as we are, yet without sin. His hands of mercy are therefore capable, and when he asks you to trust in his word, and to lean on him and ask whatever you wish, he is not being naive. He knows exactly what ails you, and he wants to heal you and help you. But like any good doctor knows, he doesn't want to only heal the symptoms. Jesus gets at the root cause of all your problems. Jesus gets there seeing all your pains and aches and that they come from sin itself. Sin brings about all the darkness in this world and ultimately brings death and hell. And yet Jesus heals you of that demise. He calls your attention then away from the pool to the cross where sin was ultimately paid for. He calls your attention away from the bubbling fountain of whatever you think you need and to his empty grave where he shows you victory over death itself. Which means when you die, you will leave for, or live forever with him and have perfect healing and peace at your Lord's side. Jesus calls your attention away from obsession and fear, and rather to his ascension and eternal throne at the right hand of the Father, to show you that he is in control, guiding you from your, for your highest good, and protecting you in your faith in him. He leads us away from our tears of despair to see his promise that he will come again to take you to himself in heaven. Jesus, your house of mercy, shows you that your greatest problems have been addressed. Sin has been addressed. The confi this confidence gives you strength to endure the rest of life's story. 
if it's persecution, remember that Jesus dwelt among the three of his three servants through their hardship and even used their witness to Nebuchadnezzar and the rest of Babylon. If it's unfounded and unfair criticism, remember that Jesus died to save all and that his mercy and grace is what defines you as Christian and absolves your neighbor of their sin, enlightening them with the best construction. If it's fear of death, your house of mercy, Jesus has given you the comforting knowledge that death is simply sleep for the redeemed of God, waiting to wake up in eternal glory. And for those with physical ailments, you know, I can put it no better than the hymnist who says, When through fiery trials your pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be your supply. The flames shall not hurt you. I only design your dross to consume, those weaknesses of yours to consume, and your gold to refine. Jesus is your house of mercy, your Bethesda. And to reflect that one more time, I will use another hymn verse, which says, Haste then on from grace to glory, armed by faith and winged by prayer. Heaven's eternal days before you, God's own hand shall guide you there. Soon shall close your earthly mission, shoot soon and swift shall pass your pilgrim days. Hope soon change to glad fruition, faith to sight and prayer to praise. Your house of mercy, Jesus Christ, gets you through, shows you that you are redeemed, and one day faith changed to sight and prayer changed to praise. You will sing that praise with him, glorified, reigning with Christ in heaven. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Continue with verses 5 through 8 of 523. Please be seated.
Please rise. As long as our, with our other prayer requests, we have two special requests for guidance and healing and providence. First for Mike Schaumann. He was recently hospitalized, yet has been released since then. So we pray for his, pray for his health and for the Lord's healing and grace. And also for Pastor Timothy Daub of our sister congregation, Prince of Peace, Hecla, on his um, journey over to Pakistan on behalf of the Board of Missions, he um, suffered some severe uh, seizures and trauma on the plane ride and was hospitalized in Dubai. He's been recovering. Um, he's been recovering well, and we give this also into the Lord's hands of healing too. O oh Jesus, our only Savior from sin. Keep us from building our hopes on this earthly life with its sins and sorrows, its shallow pleasures and its imperfect treasures. Lord, give each of us an earnest longing for that day when we shall be with you, which is far better. In the midst of the troubles and uncertainties of this life, let not our hearts be filled up with fearfulness and anxiety, but give us a calm trust that calls on you for help in every time of need. Having placed all in your hands, ourselves, our troubles, our cares, our needs, our fears, our failures, our sins, our very futures, give us the strength and courage to go on and meet one by one the battles of life, never doubting you will make everything turn out for our good. Trusting in you, O Lord, we ask you to save us from all our foes who oppress us and from all things that afflict us. O Lord, we ask that you be with Mike Schaumann as you present your guiding hand of grace and healing. Keep him in your grace and mercy and guide him towards you and your son for comfort and healing. O Lord, we also ask that you keep Pastor Timothy Daub and, his, and the congregation of Prince of Peace, Hecla and Redeemer Baudel and his family in your care, caring concern as you give your healing in due season to Pastor Daub and give comfort and assurance through your son and his, and his powerful grace to both his congregations that he serves and his family and we ask that you keep this faith of theirs strong through your word, looking to you evermore as the savior of, from their sins and this, the comforter of their souls. All this we ask in Jesus' name, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen receive a believing hearts a blessing from our lord the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We close with hymn 39. Please be seated. <coughs>